we have a couple of more presentations in the afternoon. Um, the first one would be, uh, again, an INA update um, and the post-transition uh, arrangements. Um, I still can't get my mouth around pronouncing that whole thing properly. Uh, but we have uh, Nyla uh, Saras from, uh, I would say ICANN, um, here to give us an update. Okay, thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for giving us a few moments here to talk about um, the IANA um, and, the tra and the arrangements going forward. So um, I'm going to talk about two topics. Uh, the first one, I just want to quickly talk about the um, IPv4 recovered pool allocation, um, only because that's an important the year, and, it, and then I'll go um, into the PTI arrangements as well. It's labeled on the agenda here, and kind of talk a little bit about that. So, um, as you all know, we have um, a recovered pool of IP addresses that we um, give back to the IIRs twice a year, uh, 1st of March and 1st of September of every calendar year. Uh, the most recent one we ran was the 1st of September, and each of the RIRs got an equivalent of slash 18. This is in keeping um, with the global and the allocation tool, we often get questions right before the allocation is about to happen of what space um, each RIR will be getting. And I just linked it here because there's just to remind the people that anyone can download the tool and run it on their own before INA even makes the allocation. Um, this is a slide just showing who got what with the um, APNIC space highlight, uh, highlighted. And um, if we keep going at this rate, if we don't receive back any other space, uh, we have five more allocations to go. And as was said this morning, they keep getting smaller and smaller. And the last allocation is um, expected to happen in March 2019. And then we're really done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't fight over that one. Um, OK, so what we're all talking about here, um, intro to PTI. So PTI, I'm going to talk about it, how we came. Um, so PTI, not to, I'm going to talk about it as post-transition IANA first, because that's what the term that appeared in all the proposals up until now, and then the term that we're using for PTI now. Um, Paul Wilson yesterday gave a very good history of the last two and a half years of all the work, that the tireless work that the community did to get us to this point. Uh, plus the 16 plus years that the work was actually supposed to happen. Um, so quickly here, following the announcement by NTIA in, to, in March 2014, their intent to let the, the um, NTIA contract expire, the communities came together, the name, there were three proposals from the names community, the numbers community, and the protocol parameters. Those were sent to the coordination group, who then harmonized the uh, proposal, and resolved any um, conflicts in it. And that was all sent to the uh, US government in March of this year. And in March of this year, in June, the US government said they're comfortable with the proposal. Um, in general, what the proposal called for um, is really what we need, what I would like to draw your attention to here um, is that the, uh, there be an entity created called was referred to in the proposal as the post-transition IANA, and that entity would look after the three functions, the names, numbers, and protocol parameters. And this picture is really hard to read, but if you have access to the slides, please go and look at it. And it's not new. I think this has appeared in other um, materials throughout this whole transition. But you can see here the different mechanisms that were uh, proposed by the community for how to replace the oversight and to, um, that, that was now provided by the NTIA to, for that oversight to be replaced by the community um, and how we would do reporting and stay accountable, et cetera. Um, so, so that was the proposal. That was what the community went with, what the US government said, good, let's go. And then last Friday, literally, I, I, I'm, I really, I'm not exaggerating, 
everything. It was minutes. Uh, my boss was in Costa Rica. Our other staff was in the LA office, and everybody was, was saying, it's minute by minute. We just wait. And then finally, the injunction order was turned down, and then we were told, OK, wait until midnight. <laughs> Because uh, we had some things geared for, even though we're saying business as usual, there are actually some changes that we need to do um, on the operational side, and I'll go a little bit into that. So, uh, proposal accepted, um, September 30th came and went, the contract expired, the internet is still working because I see people on Facebook, uh, so everything is still good, nothing has melted. Um, PTI was the acronym that we went with. Um, but we were told it can't be, we, it can't be public uh, post-transition IANA, so come up with something. Um, but it had to keep the same acronym, PTI. So it's, it's public technical identifiers, and that's indeed the name that the PTI is registered under. It's not a name that's easily coming to us, so forgive us if sometimes we actually have to think and say, oh, it stands for this. Uh, but in keeping organization was actually created, and um, we go into different aspects of what the PTI is here. So from a legal perspective, it's a not-for-profit organization. Um, it's, it's wholly owned by ICANN. It's domiciled in Cal California and organized under 501c3 tax status. It has a separate budget from the ICANN budget. It will have a four-year strategic plan that's visited annually. Um, and it will have its own uh, finances and reporting. In terms of what it's tasked for under operations, it does the names, protocol parameters, and number services, um, just as specified in the contract. And um, all the resources that we need to do these will still come from ICANN. So we have, in the names area, for example, we have um, a system called Root Zone. Uh, management system. It's a workflow system that the requests come through. Um, that support for that system will still come through the ICANN um, technical uh, team. Uh, the ticketing system that you all interact with, um, with us through uh, the RT ticketing system, that's also maintained by our technical team, uh, etc. The PTI, public, the public Technical Identifiers, also has its own board, uh, separate from the ICANN board. Uh, its uh, members are, the, it has five members, three are ICANN staff, and two are com uh, community members. And uh, those, that, mem that board is seated and functional. Um, the three ICANN staff are Akram Atala, the GDD president, uh, David Conrad, the CTO, and Elise Garrick, the president of um, PTI. And then from the community, it's Lisa Furr and Jonathan Robinson. PTI also has three officers. The president is Elise Garrick, a treasurer who's not named here, but we actually have names. It's, uh, her name is Becky Nash, and a secretary, um, Samantha Eisner. And the part that's I, truly what everybody has been saying here, it's nothing has changed, is that the same staff that staff the IANA department are now um, the staffing the PTI. Um, and all the existing systems that we have are still the same. Uh, the, our status, and I've heard this question this week, oh, you know, what are you? Are you a PTI employee? Are you, are you still an ICANN employee? We are still ICANN employees. Um, and the term they're using is secondment. So we're ICANN employees that are seconded, or I guess on loan to PTI. We, we fully do PTI, um, the IANA services under PTI, but we're still ICANN employees. So we took this picture and kind of uh, gave a little bit of focus to the relationship between RIRs and the PTI. So PTI is this organization that houses the um, IANA services, or carries out the IANA services. It's an affiliate of ICANN, as I said earlier. Um, the, um, in this case, we'll, we'll take the RIRs. Um, the RIRs have already done their work, and as was reported earlier, an SLA already has been signed with ICANN for the, um, for the numbers functions. So that SLA that's been signed with ICANN is now tasked to the PTI through an intercompany contract. So the three, com the names, numbers, and protocol parameters communities 
sign agreements with ICANN, and then there's an agreement between ICANN and PTI. It's an intercompany agreement that says, now do these functions. Uh, the, the rest of the picture is muted, but it's good to also look at it, because here you'll see, um, the, again, the different oversight committees, uh, the relationship between the PTI board and PTI, and the ICANN board, and the bylaws, um, a lot going on on this picture, uh, but it tries to summarize um, how the oversight was replaced now that the uh, contract is expired. So, um, so I can enter, I, I, here we have bubbles that are explaining, I can enter, enter into an, um, a service level agreement with the RIRs for the performance of the IANA functions. Um, as specified in the, P, in the ICG proposal, ICANN will now subcontract these this services to the PTI, and then ICANN will be accountable for the performance of IANA numbers function and services to the RIRs. Um, change, well, the, I can assure you that the staff is committed to continuing the, hopefully, the good service that we provide, if not improving it. Uh, we'll still produce the same reports that you're used to seeing. Uh, we have ideas for improvements that we want to do for the reports, but certainly the same reports that you're used to seeing um, that actually meet also the SLA requirements because there's uh, specifications in the SLA requirement of what things we need to report on, how soon we need to do the requests once we receive them, et cetera. We'll continue for this community to do allocation of numbers, of course. Um, and then all of our reports are posted on IANA.org, which will remain our operational site um, for, the, um, for the IANA functions. Um, I think, as I said earlier, we have our own separate budget as the PTI. Um, and because this, we just started the fiscal year, FY17, we just started in July. Uh, but because we now have to develop a PTI budget and have it approved and then catch it on to the rest of the ICANN budget, the planning for FY18 actually already started um, about a month ago. And in the, I, in the PTI bylaws, it says that we have to put that budget, we have to follow the same ICANN process, put that budget out for, um, and we also have to socialize the budget with the communities. So um, I encourage you to please take a look at the budget. It's coming out, it, will, it, should, it has to be published to the public, uh, for public comment on the 17th of October. Um, and it will follow the same ICANN process that you're probably used to. I, I think, I don't know exactly how long it'll be out for public comment, and then we'll take comments and then put out another version, um, and then eventually it'll be approved by the PTI board and it will join the rest of the ICANN budget. Uh, roughly, it's about a nine million budget for uh, nine million US dollars for FY18. It's about a half a million dollar um, increase from the last year's budget. And those are accounted for in extra staffing that's projected in FY18 and uh, some of the um, additional costs from oversight activities, such as uh, the PTI board, the different um, committees that are now um, providing the oversight. So that's what accounts for the extra, this for FY18. Um, and so, if, you, if you're concerned, have we changed? No, we're not, we're different, we're not different, we're the same staff. How do you reach us? The same, same way where you've always reached us. The PTI is the organization that houses the IANA services. The IANA services uh, are still carried out by the same staff and you use the same method to reach us. Um, I think um, at this community, I, I noticed that they're used to emailing us at ian at iana.org. Uh, that goes into like a centralized area of the ticketing system and then we, we farm it out to the different queues based on what the request is about. And one thing that is um, an addition for us is our, our emails will now work um, for at iana.org and at ican.org. So you can email us at either one and we'll get it. And then I think when we email you back, we'll be emailing from at IANA.org. Um, so you try it if you want, but they're functional, the emails. And so the happy faces of PTI. Um, I think you're familiar with the staff. It's the same people. Um, I think this day we were just having fun with coming up with a logo. We still don't have a logo. We don't have stationery. We really don't have much. We just wrote PTI on the board. Um, but we really, we thank you for your time. I don't know, Gaurav, what's the, uh, 
what's the idea for questions if we have any? Is it when we have a... Actually, we'll do the questions right now because it's not easy to combine right. yours with uh, all the other following through. So any questions for Naila? Hi, Nale. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's really good to know, you know where, where it is now uh, post-transition. Uh, Can you go back to the slides where it has the uh, relationship between PTI and yeah, this one? This one, yes. Okay. What's the, so the IANA department under ICANN, uh, do they still exist? Yeah. Um, and what would they do? <laughs> uh, so, um, I, I, I will, I, I, I think, that, no, I, there is another department under ICANN, um, okay. but, I, but I think this is, and I can get a further clarification on this. Remember, your relationship and your accountability is with ICANN, and our accountability to you is through ICANN. Um, so the, the contracts are being signed with ICANN, and then somebody at ICANN needs to be accountable um, for, for, for all the, you know, for the performance of the, of the functions. And so I think this is the part where, so we have to do reports, for example. We have to submit reports to ICANN saying this is how we're doing and this is how well we're doing the function within the, um, in accordance with the SLAs. Uh, so I think this is the part that's monitoring that part. But there are no, all of the, the staff that I showed you at the end, all of us, the current IANA staff, we're PTI staff. There isn't another IANA department that's All being right. organized under ICANN. Okay, just yeah. need that clarification. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, Bill Woodcock, Aaron, and PCH. Um, did I hear you correctly saying that you were applying for a 501c3 tax yeah. exemption? Yes. Why C3 rather than C6? Uh, uh, that's way, way above my uh, pay grade. I don't know. That's, that's what, how they organized it. So I can take that question. C3 I, could, I don't even know what a C3 is a and a C3 is. A C3 is an educational institution. A C6 is an industry association. Okay. I will, um, I will check with Samantha Eisner, and we will email you. Huh? Um, I, I believe ICANN itself is a C3, but I'm not sure. It, it could be because of its history back with... ISI, but uh, we'll, we'll check. Uh, thank you, everyone, for q and Thank you, Naila. Thank you. Um, thank Paul, you. we do the honors. Um, now, I actually have, uh, you know, from the very first uh, minute of this meeting, we've been talking about the INA uh, transition. And we just heard about the post-transition INA. Um, so in that context, uh, we've worked on a declaration on behalf of the APNI community to be made uh, at this meeting. I'm going to read it out, and if you can proclaim it by applause, um, you know, th statements like this are something we make um, as things happen. But uh, because we are meeting here, uh, we would like this to be of, you know, something that all the members are participated in. Um, so we make the declaration on INA stewardship transition, the transition of the stewardship of the INA functions from the United States government to the global internet community is a significant achievement that is 18 years in the making. At the world's fastest growing internet region, it was vital that the voice of the Asia-Pacific was heard in the INA transition, stewardship transition process, and we salute the tireless effort of all those involved. This is celebration of the process as much as it is of the results. The process has, once again, demonstrated that the multi-stakeholder model works and is the best governance model to maintain a growing, stable, and open internet. No single person, company, organization, or government runs the internet. It belongs to everyone. The APNE community will continue to manage internet resource, resources responsibly and is ready to assume its role in the oversight of these critical functions. Uh, 
I think we'll start calling it the Colombo Declaration. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we continue with uh, ICANN related. Uh, uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, I'm giving this, um, this report uh, in place of uh, the normal person, the chair of the NROEC, who this year is Oscar Robles. Who's, he hasn't been able to be here, so I've agreed to provide the NRO update. Um, so you can, uh, you can imagine uh, that I'm wearing Oscar's hat uh, at, uh, just at the moment. The NRO has defined its mission uh, to, be, uh, to be the flagship and global leader for collaborative internet number resource management as a central element of an open, stable and secure internet. If you haven't heard of the internet, for, 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 sorry, of the NRO, I'm sorry, for, um, for those few of you who may not, it is the um, umbrella organization for the RIRs. So I'm gonna be telling you about the NRO, I'm gonna be talking about its key focus, I'm gonna be talking about a few of its activities, including, I'm afraid, the IANA stewardship transition. So there's a promise broken, but I'm not uh, Paul Wilson here, I'm uh, Oscar Robles. So the uh, NRO was established in 2003, quite some time ago, but as a lightweight unincorporated association, as I said, umbrella for coordination of the five regional internet registries. The mission is to promote a coordinated internet number registry system, promoting the multi-stakeholder model and the bottom-up policy development process, which you should have seen in action here uh, this week at APNIC, to coordinate and support the joint activities of the RARs and to act as a focal point for input into the system and to fulfill the role of ICANN's address supporting organization. One of the council, and we had an election for a number, number council member today, so there's a good example of how this meeting here at APNIC is feeding into the NRO, feeding into ICANN. Our key focus areas are, I think I've said it, uh, supporting our RAR coordination, uh, also global collaboration and governance coordination in the uh, internet numbers area, and also to monitor and contribute to global internet governance discussions in, again, in the number resource area, the IP addressing and related area. In 2016, we have an executive committee that rotates every year, so this year I've been there. Alan and Axel are the two other members, so we represent the five RIRs. The Secretariat uh, rotates, and uh, LACNIC has been, I think Aaron has been the Secretariat actually uh, this year, and uh, APNIC uh, will be the Secretariat uh, next year. There are several coordination groups for communications, engineering, registration services, etc. The NRO finances are all open and transparent. Uh, there are, are a number of expenses. The largest one is that we make a contribution voluntarily to ICANN every year of about um, 820,000 US dollars, and that's something that's split amongst the five regional internet registries. So that's uh, one of the expense items that APNIC uh, funds each year is our contribution to the NRO for that purpose, as well as some other things, uh, communications amongst the RIR coordination groups and things like the uh, ASO Address Council, which is also supported by the NRO. We have an executive secretary, Herman Valdez, who's uh, the only full-time uh, staff hired by the NRO. So we actually uh, budget and fund the NRO from the five RARs in proportion with the size of the RIR in terms of our own budgets and, and in fact, our, our resource IP address holdings. We've pledged... Uh, to a joint RAR stability fund, which is also available in case of any disruptions or emergencies. We've got about $2.1 million pledged into this joint fund, just in case of any, um, any need that might arise. We published the Internet Number Status Report, and that was presented here uh, this week, showing uh, the global view. We provide also a comparative policy overview. So each of the five RARs have got our own independent parallel bottom-up policy process. And we all deal with IP addressing, AS numbers, policies for transfers, for IPv6, for last slash eight, and all of, those, all of those aspects. We all deal with them according to the, to the community's wishes. They can deviate a little bit because each community has got different priorities and different, a different order of doing things. Uh, so we do publish a, a comparative policy overview 
uh, under the NRO so that people can get a good guide at the global level to how the RARs compare. We also do that actually in terms of the governance of the five RARs. So if you want to understand the governance of the RAR system, you have to look at the five RARs and you can look comparatively across uh, this document to see how the, how the five RARs uh, compare and how they manage, thing, manage aspects of governance to do with bylaws and PDPs and dispute resolutions and so on and so forth. There is an FAQ on RAR accountability, which is something that we've been taking a good look at lately, uh, particularly in light of the, all of the work on ICANN accountability. We felt that, uh, that the RARs need to also reflect a, a priority and a focus on that. And we conducted an, an independent accountability review, which was actually part of this transition process to make sure that we had, um, we had those documents properly uh, covered and available for um, anyone who was interested to look. Uh, the IANA transition. So the service level agreement that we have is the new relationship between the US government and the RIRs for IANA services, or are they PTI services now? That uh, service level agreement was really specified by the CRISP group. It was signed already in, uh, back in um, ICANN 56, but it is now active. Now that the transition has happened, Happened now that the US government's own contract with ICANN has expired, that uh, service level agreement is in place and it's active. One aspect of that review of that contract, of that SLA, is a review committee, and that committee is comprised of people from each of the regions who will together serve to ensure that the IANA services are being provided in compliance. Same actually as the number council. So at APNIC right now we have Dr. A.J. Kumar and Tomohiro Fujisaki as the elected community representatives uh, to the Number Council and, and hence also to the Review Committee. But A.J. will be replaced by uh, Brajesh Jain uh, at the end of this year because when Brajesh's uh, position on the Address Council becomes active. And we also have George Kuo as the staff rep on the Review Committee. And you can also see there where the other, um, what the other RIRs are doing in terms of re Review Committee appointments. The ICANN accountability process was steered by something called the CCWG, the Cross Community Working Group. We had RIR representatives that came through that, that, that were appointed by the NRO uh, into the CCWG. Uh, Izumi Okutani deserves thanks for her role as our member, not only uh, on the CRISP team, but also on the CCWG on accountability. Uh, Athena from RIPE, Fiona, from Afrinic and Horke from uh, LACNIC as well. And in fact, uh, this thing's not over because now, now that CCWG is continuing to look at accountability improvements that continue after the, uh, after the ICANN transition. These are the things that, these are the aspects of accountability that they decided could wait until after the transition. Uh, they, did, uh, they decided a bunch of uh, accountability adjustments and changes that were implemented already as part of the transition. Okay, there's uh, some new agreements on intellectual property rights. Uh, those, those have been covered. The team that uh, would hold the IANA intellectual property rights, and that's been done. There's a, a community coordination group as part of that. The, the, the uh, acronyms here are very, um, very numerous, but we've got a CCG for uh, the uh, IPRs, three representatives from the RIRs looking after that the supervision or the oversight of those intellectual property rights agreements. Okay. There's one group that um, are the unsung heroes of, uh, of this, um, this uh, whole process. And I know, Craig, you're not used to that uh, particular reference, but you are one of the unsung heroes. There were five members of a legal team, uh, Ashok from Afrinic, Craig Ng from Apinic, Michael from Aaron. Eduardo from LACNIC and Athena from RIPE NCC, and they did a lot of work. Like the CRISP team, they, uh, they did a lot of work towards the SLA, towards the accountability, towards the RAR, uh, the RAR accountability, as well as the ICANN accountability work. So I just wanted to um, not let it pass without thanking and acknowledging the RAR legal team for, for their work. So could you help me in uh, celebrating that, please? <laughs> Now, anniversaries, uh, it's three years um, since 
in some respects, uh, some of this process started. And I'll take you back to October uh, 2013. And you may have missed this particular um, publication that came out of the NRO. Uh, the RARs, uh, the NROEC, the RAR heads had got together with the ISTAR organizations, with other members of the, of the Global Internet Technical Coordination Community, ICANN, ISOC, and IETF, IABs, and so forth. We met in Montevideo in Uruguay in 2000. Uh, we produced something called the Montevideo Statement. Now that statement uh, was a sort of an urgent call from this ISTAR group to say that uh, internet governance needed some progress. We needed to get going again or to re-energize re and, uh, and revive efforts to uh, evolve the global multi-stakeholder internet cooperation system. We called for accelerating the globalization of ICANN and IANA functions towards an environment in which all stakeholders, including governments, participate equally. That came after some um, political uh, scandals over the Snowden revelations where we found that some of the IANA, some of the, I, the internet organizations were being sort of confused with some of what was revealed in those, those, uh, those revelations as though we might have been, there might have been some confusion or some complicity or some involvement. We felt that uh, really this, effort towards the globalization of, of, of IANA needed some more energy to make sure that it was removed from what was increasingly political. Now, I won't, uh, I won't claim the, that this was the only influence, but this was in October 2013, and then in March 2014, we had the US government's um, announcement about their intention to, to move ahead. So I'm proud of our involvement with the Montevideo statement, I think, to the extent that um, that uh, it was influential, it was important. I'd also like to note that um, the seeds of this idea actually came from a meeting of the RIR heads at um, Raul Echeverria's house, a, a pre-meeting before the uh, ISTAR meeting, where we actually agreed that we would be initiating and pushing for a statement out of this, uh, this ISTAR meeting. So that's something that I'd, I'd like to sort of put on record to mention that the RIRs themselves together were really part of the initiation of this thing that may have played really an important role in where we are today. So it tells you a little bit about some of the global coordination that the RIRs do, that the NRO does, and how we've, um, I hope, have had an effect on some of the, uh, the um, developments that you've seen lately. So thanks very much for that. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I don't see anyone standing up, so we move on to the next one. Um, the next one will have the cooperation SIG report by Dr. Govind. Thank you, Chair. Uh, cooperation SIG was held yesterday, uh, 4th October, in ballroom number one. Uh, I chaired the session along with the, sorry, along with the Bill, Billy from South Korea. And uh, the panelists were uh, myself, co-chair, then Izumi talk, talked about update on IGF. Ayana transition update was given by Paul Wilson. Pacific region update was Maureen Hilliard. ISOC Sri Lanka by Sagarika. And uh, some chair election review by Adam. So I will talk a little bit about the, you know, what uh, everyone said, not in detail. So the point made by Billy mentioned about the Asia-Pacific Internet Governance uh, School held in South Korea, in CEO, a university where the Internet Governance program was taken up. And uh, the issues discussed were more on the 
internet, history of internet, issues of internet and the cyber security and those kind of issues. There were uh, local and international participants as well as speakers who made the presentations. The Izumi elaborated on the how the IGF evolved from the 2005 VCIS agenda, open to everyone, with a multi-stakeholder dialogue process, taking up the IG issues and MAG preparation for preparing for the workshops and other sessions based on the inputs from the various stakeholders and the uh, internet community. Next, IGF is scheduled in 6 to 9 December in uh, Mexico, and new chair would be the Lynn Armour. The theme would be the enabling inclusive and sustainable growth. One of the important points mentioned by Izumi was the IPv6 best practices forum, wherein one can upload the stories of IPv6 through the surveys in RIA region, and this will be consolidated and shared among the community. Mr. Paul provided an overview of the INF transition, gave a very comprehensive details with the chronological process will be ensuring, and he mentioned about why it is essential is to continue the stability during and after the transition process, ensuring that policy processes are protected, removing US government's special role, and one extraordinary example of the global community participating and making it feasible, the INA transition in a very extraordinary manner. Maureen made a presentation on the Pacific Island growth story on ICT and cybersecurity, talked about the challenges and opportunities, need for regulatory reforms, capacity building, and emphasized about the collaborations and cooperations across the region should be inclusive of government, private sector, research community, and civil society. So Sagarika made a presentation of the ISOC Sri Lanka chapter with the aim of popularizing internet, community involvement, women empowerment, reaching remote areas, capacity building, etc. I would like to mention two points as a chair, which I observed over the many of these uh, cooperation SIG. I'm, I observed that the agendas of the cooperation SIG are expanding and more and more speakers and topics are coming up and we are not able to provide adequate time and slots. One idea may be that we may have two sessions, one to discuss the policy issues and other to bring out the developments taking place or taking place in the region. Other point is to do with the layout of the session. It may be structured in a way that participants and speakers may be sitting on a rectangular shape like held in ICANN and IGF kind of settings at the same level so that more interactive and involved discussions may take place. These are my two suggestions and it is up to the community to think it so that the scope and level of interaction of cooperation Next is the, I think, the group photo. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Any, Dr. Questions? Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Govind, once again. The next we have uh, the BOF report for IPv6 uh, readiness measurement by Shen Xiong. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shen Xiongzhen. It's my great pleasure to introduce the IPv6 readiness measurement buff report. Firstly, I will briefly introduce the current status of the IPv6 readiness measurement. And then I will describe the data analysis of IPv6 readiness. And finally, I'll give a conclusion. As you can see, the last IPv6 readiness measurement buff meeting 
was held in yesterday afternoon. And uh, we have invited six speakers, including the members from Langnick, Akamai, Sri Lanka, Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. And uh, there are more than 80 attendants in the BAF meeting. And the first speaker is Mr. Carlos Martinez from NACNIC. And Carlos showed uh, some successful experience. And uh, NACNIC developed a new indicator. It's so-called uh, ICAV6. It's an IPv6 deployment progress indicator that adapts the Cisco formula to take into account the planning stage for countries starting to deploy IPv6. As you may know, the Cisco's ratio depends on three metrics, including the IPv6 enabled transit AS, and IPv6 content, and the IPv6 users. And uh, the NANIC is one more metric that is the ratio of allocated v6 prefixes with observed traffic to all the allocations. As you can see, the formula, uh, basically the indicators is the linear combination of the infrastructure part and the, the content the user part. And 30% of the ratios comes from the infrastructure part. And the 70% of the ratio comes from the content and the user part. And the second speaker is Mr. Kazi Young from Akamai. Uh, Kazi Young uh, mentioned that Akamai observed the three drivers of IPv6 growth including the content availability, access network providers, and the end user device support. And Akamai also observed some IPv6 only deployment for mobile networks with DNS 64 plus NAT 64 and the bypass expensive NAT 44 infrastructures. And Akamai also publishes the state of the internet report and shows some countries percentage of requests over IPv6 to dual stack size on Akamai in previous years. And the third speaker is Mr. Rohiranka 3CC. Uh, Mahara mentioned that Sri Lanka has 10 ISPs and uh, the ISP working group uh, which was established in 2011, develops the national IPv6 roadmap, including the BGP advertisement, network traffic, user readiness, DNS query from CCTRD over IPv6, and the web services availability over IPv6. And in the near future, dual stack supported by default. The fourth speaker is Ms. Jen Ru from Kiza, Korea. And currently in Korea, LTE mobile service has more than 6 billion IPv6 devices, and the cable TV service has 16,000 IPv6 subscribers. And Kiza also measures IPv4 exhaustion, ISPs, IPv6 deployment, and the contents IPv6 deployment. And Kisa also shows the statistics in Google, Cisco, Akama, Epinic, and etc. And the fifth speaker is Fujisaki san from NTT Japan. Uh, Fujisaki san said many fixed line ISPs have started the IPv6 service for both enterprise activity and IPv6 ready government services are increasing a major mobile carrier, NTT Docomo. KDDI and the SoftBank will start full IPv6 service in 2017. And large content providers do not support IPv6 yet, but some big content providers start to consider to implement IPv6. And Jinghen uh, was the last speaker. 
Jinghen uh, from Tidermnik. And Jinghen updated the status of the IP6 upgrade in Taiwan's government, academia, and the ISPs. And Jinghen also updated the status of three common measurement criteria, uh, including IPv6 allocation, the BGP advertisement, user availability, and the service availability. Let's move to the data analysis of IPv6 readiness. Uh, as you can see in this figure, uh, according to the RIP NCC survey, the BGP advertisement is increasing smoothly all over the world. Let's take a look at the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the average in Asia Pacific region has arrived at 27.7%. And as you can see, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore are over 40%, and Malaysia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Thailand are over 30%. And let's move to the service availability. Uh, service availability usually includes the web service availability, email service availability, and the DNS service availability. Uh, according to this for HCCTLD, as you can see in this figure, uh, the service availability, the web service availability is increasing smoothly. And uh, you can find that Thailand became, become the first, become the first one in this year, and the Malaysia become the second one in this year. Let's take a look uh, at the user availability. Uh, according to the APNIC, survey here has arrived at 4.64%, and the top four countries remained the same in last year, uh, congregation to Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, and Australia. And, and as, you, as you can see, the IPv6 user availability is also increasing smoothly in the last year. And finally, I'd like to make a conclusion. Uh, in addition to measurement results from the public existing data sources, the results from CCTRG databases are also presented. And uh, Lechnik gives a possible answer to the question, why is IPv6 deployment only slowly progressing throughout Lechnik's service regions? I think the, the new indicators is a good model for the country starting to deploy IPv6. So we can learn something from Technique. And uh, different methodologies and criteria of readiness measurement are very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think this week we've seen a lot of uh, V6 uh, related measurements. Hopefully, the numbers keep going up and to the right. That's what we. The next presentation would be about APNIC 44, uh, which is uh, about a year from now. The next, next APNIC meeting, of course, <coughs> will be in Ho Chi Minh City with Apricot, but I'd like to invite iChain to talk about APNIC 44. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ai Chin Lu from TWNIC. Uh, today I'm here to introduce APNIC 44 meeting. Before I start, I would like to thank the APNIC for giving us this opportunity to be a local host again. As you may know, most of APNIC's members have been to Taipei before, so this time we choose another beautiful city for the, as a venue city. So APNIC 44 meeting will take place in Taizong City, Taiwan, in September of 2017. Taizong City is located in the center of Taiwan. She is an international city while playing an important role in both in cultural and industrial in Taiwan. Yeah, I think important things is Taipei, uh, Taizong City government will agree to support this meeting and they have prepared a small video, I think about the six minutes to show, to give us the Taizong City. I think now let's watch the video.
Taichung is a city full of dynamic culture. Here, visitors from around the world can experience eight kinds of folk activities and 20 kinds of traditional arts all year long. With ancient and unique architectures scattering around Taichung, over 100 historic monuments, sites and buildings meticulously preserved and maintained, visitors can savor Taichung's centuries-old cultural heritage. Taichung City has a vibrant scene of cultural activity with three performance centers, Zhongshan Hall, Taichung Metropolitan Opera House, Fulfillment Amphitheater, and four cultural centers, offering a variety of cultural activities to visitors. Be it a cultural activity, theater, opera, or concert, you name it, Taichung has got it all. Cultural and creative industry has been a developing focus of Taichung City. The city government transformed public-owned old residential property into a cluster for 108 young entrepreneurs to fulfill their dreams. The city government also provides counseling service for these young entrepreneurs to shine with unique products. Taichung City now has the third most cultural and creative boutiques island-wide. Taichung City Government leads the way in building the cultural and creative industry in Taichung. Taichung Government is pushing the Greater Taichung 123, which will connect the mountain line and coastline, following the example of Japan's Yamanote Line. The Taichung Mountains, while the two international transport hubs, Taichung Port and Taichung Airport, drive the economy and international tourism and develop three suburban centers for a more balanced city development. The comprehensive public transportation network will build an efficient city for Taichung citizens. Combining the 10 kilometer free bus ride and Bike 369 project, Taichung City created a compound transportation system in the hope of building an eco-friendly and low-carbon footprint. Taichung is a manufacturing powerhouse that includes industries such as precise technology, photoelectricity, machinery, hand tools, bicycles, and aerospace, earning the title of a 60-kilometer road that influences the world. In order to bolster industrial competitiveness, Taichung City built cross-sector alliances and launched the Industry 4.0 initiative, envisioning to boost the domestic economy of central Taiwan. Taichung is home to many renowned franchises, with all kinds of shopping centers and boutique hotels flourishing in vigor and vitality. With diversified industries invigorating economic growth, the city of Taichung is the frontrunner for central Taiwan's economy. When people think of Taichung, the first thing that comes to mind is the amazing delicacies. From street food to gourmet delicacies, Taichung is sure to satisfy everyone's taste buds. Fengjian Night Market is the largest night market in central Taiwan, with over 10,000 people visiting every day. With shopping strips all around Taichung, eating and shopping is ever so easy. Yeah, I think from this video, you can have a brief view of uh, Taichung City. And now on behalf of TJAMIC, I would like to invite you to go to uh, Taichung in APNIC 44. Okay, let's explore in Taichung City, and I will see you all in September 2017. Thank you.
Okay, so we come to the time designated for open mic, uh, but I already had a couple of requests um, to fill up in the open mic section. Um, not you, Adam. Um, we are first going to request a quick two-minute update on women in ICT, who is someone is going to do the FIFA is going to do the presentation on women in ICT first. And then we'll have a quick three minute update from the fellows buff. A very good afternoon, all of you. I'm going to report on women in ICT session. Um, on the very first day of our EPNIC 42 conference, we had a women in ICT fruitful session that was moderated by Duncan. Uh, as, an, uh, as a reporter, I'm delighted to let you all know that we, uh, there were about around 100 men and women were present to actively participate on that session. Um, the presence of handsome number, a handsome number of women actually, uh, men and women actually proving that, especially the presence of men was really overwhelming and it, they were proving that they actually support women in ICT. Uh, on that session, we had five leading women experts of Sri Lanka shared their wonderful stories and challenge, challenges in women in ICT industry. So the first speaker was Shagarika uh, uh, who is currently working as a network assistant manager in a university in Colombo. She, was, she worked uh, for so long as a network engineer and she stated in her uh, uh, presentation that it's not a nine to five job, it's uh, being a network engineer is not an easy job. And right on that moment, she is also a president of ISOC Sri Lankan chapter and she, during her uh, presentation, she mentioned few of her achievements she did in uh, Sri Lankan ISOC chapter. The second speaker was uh, Dilika Diaz. Uh, she is a professor of electronics and telecommunication engineering. So in her presentation, she also mentioned that the mobile operators, the number of mobile is increasing in Sri Lanka, like the number of electricity, the penetration rate is the, as, electricity as uh, like mob mobiles are increasing as the penetration of electricity. She is also happy with the fact that uh, the local operators of mobile, they are launching few applications on their local languages. So she said that really proudly. The third speaker was Mahesha. She was a professor of SLEED. She encouraged Sri Lankan women to join ICT ICT study more, and she stated that the uh, current rate of ICT uh, women in Sri lot. Speaker was uh, Chitrangani Mubarak. She is a chairperson of ICTA. So in her speech, she didn't really mention all the statistics. Rather, she mentioned one really inspiring story of the president of PepsiCo that made the entire audience all charged up. So in her uh, uh, pre presentation, she mentioned that even if having the uh, social barriers, if we have the determination, we can reach the goal. A uh, women's good uh, good news should not stay uh, should not wait just for to buy some milk. And she also stated that uh, a women should not leave their crown in garage while coming home from work. The third speaker. And the third and the last speaker was uh, Dil Kosha Gomez. She is uh, really active in IEEE. So she was a bit disappointed with the fact that the uh, competitions that are arranged by IEEE, like hackathon and robotics, the participation as women is really less. So she encouraged the participation in women. So after the session, uh, two, uh, by the panel members, two questions were attended. So one question was related to women are facing challenge in their personal life due to the work, and women, they are facing channel challenges in their work life. 
So as a solution, they propose that women should, we all should have a proper awareness session uh, to overcome the problem. And in personal life, they have suggested that we as a women, we have to create that environment so the situation goes in our favor. During the session, all of the audience, while having lunch, they were also having some table discussion. And on that discussion, few points have come up to make this session even more better. So I'd like to state that three of them. One is few, uh, few of the audience suggested not to conduct this session during lunch because it diverts the concentration. The second one was, uh, as we all know that in women in ICT session, we have all the panel members who are women. So rather than having all the women, we can introduce at least one man who will be sharing their stories, who helped any girl to reach their goal. And the third one is, uh, rather than having uh, this uh, uh, traditional women in ICD session, can we make it as a bird of feather like we had uh, in last fellows BOF to make it more fruitful? So that was the overall summary of women in ICD session of, that we had on the first day in the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I still have one more before Adam gets his turn. Um, A.K. Azizi will give a quick, I hope really quick update on the fellows, Buff. Hello everyone, uh, and thank you very much for giving me this chance. Uh, I'll be very short because we are running after time, I think. Uh, we had a Buff session. Uh, we were gathered together from 52, uh, 52 fellows from uh, different economies. We were gathered for a buff session where we had a chat with Mr. Paul, with Mr. Gaurav, and had two other very good interactive session with them. Uh, there were some doubts on techno, uh, technical par part, and at the same time, we had some doubts on the policy part of the APNIC. At the same time, we had some other questions that we asked them, and uh, the answers were replied. Uh, one of the questions which, which, come, uh, which came from Mr. Bas uh, Mr. Bashkar, uh, Bashkar Banerjee, it was like uh, the APNIC is not accessible to everyone. So everyone means a a every type of people like some disabled or those people who cannot uh, read it the way that normal people can do. So that was one of the questions uh, that was raised and Mr. Paul was there uh, to answer and they briefed uh, that uh, they'll be looking into, uh, into it. The other questions were more uh, technically asked about IP version 6. That was uh, most of the questions came uh, performance of your IP version 6 and security in IP version 6. Uh, we shared our thoughts that we have been uh, told for the last three or four days in the conference that IP version 6 has some problems. And those uh, were shared and the views were exchanged with them. Uh, at the end, uh, Mr. Sunny who was uh, the, uh, the mentor of the session and who initiated the session and then handed over to Mrs. Afifa Abbas. Uh, Mr. Sunny promised to create a blog that is uh, a forum for us where we can share our more questions. I hope, I hope that will be uh, followed and uh, we need it because we have to do more interaction because uh, many students, were, uh, many fellows were there. Uh, we, we were 52 fellows and uh, 14 uh, youths uh, with us. Uh, so we were having a lot of questions, and those questions remained uh, uh, unasked, so we just uh, want this thing that uh, Mr. Sunny proposed, uh, that he'll be creating a forum and we'll be asking our questions there. Uh, I think uh, that will be a great idea. So that was uh, in the buff, and we hope this uh, go ahead again and again. This was a very good idea, and we got a chance to interact with the guns of IT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this, uh, at this uh, meeting, we had a pretty big fellows contingent. Uh, we also extended our fellowship deadline after it was closed uh, when we decided to move the meeting. Uh, we also organized a youth fellowship this time, uh, which included a lot of students. And uh, I think overall, it is really positive to get the feedback from the fellows. Um, and. Uh, Yes, we had uh, 19 economists represented as fellows, 14 youth and 38 professionals. Uh, and the key thing is there are 60 to 40 diversity, men to women. 
Um, so thanks to everyone who uh, participated in this, um, uh, in the fellowship uh, program. Thank you. Adam, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Am I here? Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to say quickly, I'd had some questions about the co-chair election for the NIRC, and we took nominations for the co-chair position, but we didn't hold an election for that position, and some people are wondering why. Um, my understanding of the SIG guidelines are that when AJ took on the role of acting chair, he still retained his role as co-chair, which ends in about one year from now. So if he had um, been elected as chair, he would have been able to appoint a second co-chair to fill the position he'd left. As he wasn't elected chair, he reverted back to his position of co-chair. So we always had two co-chairs, and AJ didn't vacate his position, so we didn't need to run an election for that. I hope that's clear, and I hope people agree with my interpretation of the rule. Any other comments on that? Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, I think we did get some more feedback on this about, uh, and we also had an extensive discussion in the policy SIG about the SIG chair and, uh, you know, voting eligibility. So maybe um, at the next meeting we, we can have this on the agenda and discuss clarifying some of these things, uh, codifying it properly so that there is no uh, confusion uh, around it. I think um, Yeah. It's okay. You, you don't need to stand up, Masato san. <laughs> so, so let me make sure what's the, what's the gap. So currently, there is no rule or guideline when current co-chair, uh, when current co-chair to run to new chair position, whether there is no no condition whether he or she needs to resign or can stay co-chair position. So th that's the gap, right? I'm, I'm just trying to make sure people's view yeah, about, I, the, this, about this gap. I, I think the, the, the reading is um, the rules are not very well codified either yes. way, right? And it's always been done on the judgment of the chair or the community or the particular SIG. Um, so we have some, you know, well-established practices on how we do it. Maybe we probably never faced this situation before. So as I said, um, you already have a proposal on the hand. And let's work on codifying some of these uh, rules around uh, SIG chairs and SIGs. And, um, I, I hope we receive a proposal from the community on doing that. Maybe we need to revise our SIG guidelines from a work, working group uh, and look at it overall uh, rather than trying to solve. Let's look at it on a holistic basis. That, that's what I would suggest. I see. Yep. I see. Uh, can I make a suggestion about it? Well, I think uh, basically the internet community uh, we are supporting the multi stakeholder and the bottom up. So in that case, I would suggest she allow the NIR in their sick chair, uh, sick group, to discuss what kind of, instead of uh, the easy making the decisions. I think it's a very better for community to work out the solution by themselves. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, that's why I hope we get a proposal from the community that can be discussed at the next meeting. And if the NR group is not enough, AMM, before go to EC, I think there is a much better process for that. Yep, fully agree. I see Masato going back. Yeah. Uh that, uh, that co-ways comment 
uh, is I, after hearing his comment, I got another soul. This time, two, three, six. But as I briefly explained in the presentation, uh, in other region, actually different, they use different election process for policy sake and other, so in each working group. Then I think we can do same thing in here as well. Because each SIG has pretty different characters, so there is no reason why we need to set same process. However, uh, if we will discuss process in joint session, it's not so easy to figure out whether each comment is, how can I say, uh, whether to figure out which comment is about whether proposed process is appropriate for which thing, right? People might think, okay, it doesn't work for LLC, but actually it may work for policy thing. So uh, in next meeting, I don't want to raise the burr. Actually, I cannot spend so much time for this community, unfortunately, anymore. But anyway, uh, maybe in next meeting, we need to discuss, I, I will, of course, I will propose, revise my proposal and propose process again. But this uh, next time, I'd like to ask you to discuss that proposal in each SIG separately. Because as I, as I mentioned, each SIG may have different opinion and it is their choice whether they will take that proposal or not. That, that's my, my thought after hearing Kuwait's comment. Thank you. I think I'll take one more. So. Aftab Siddiqui, Intelligent Networks. Um, just from my experience of uh, working on the NRONC uh, for almost three years, what we have um, in NRONC is um, operating for procedure to appoint various people on the various com committees. And it doesn't make any difference which committee it is. The procedure remains the same. So I think uh, we should have a procedure to appoint, uh, elect chair and co-chair for the SIG and, and a guideline for that, regardless which SIG is that. And then once we have something on paper, it's better to discuss with the community rather than have an open discussion and then spend another six months coming back with another procedure. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aftab. I, I, I get the feeling that we are all saying the same thing, um, that it is the right time to start codifying through a bottoms-up approach um, the rules of the six chairs and, you know, what the organizational aspect of the six and so on. So I, I would really invite uh, the community to come up with a proposal or a proposal for a working group at the next meeting. Um, because personally, I think it's the right time because uh, we are seeing some policies. And as I said, um, I don't think we want to just address individual issues at one time, but take a holistic view. Uh, thank you about all of this. Um, I think we're running out of time, so I'll close the open mic here. Uh, we can always uh, continue this discussion on APNIC talk or on the policy SIG mailing list. Uh, before I move on to the vote of thanks, uh, we have a raffle, or a lucky draw, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we had asked people to drop their business cards at the member services lounge and to say that we would draw, do a lucky draw, and Sonny is going to do that. Thank you, Chair. Um, so. We had the member services lounge outside in the foyer for the last four days, and uh, we really appreciate for all our members visiting my colleagues Vivek, Pubudu, and George Odagi, and whoever is, uh, was on the member services lounge. And so to show our appreciation to our members, um, they have decided to have a, a raffle draw, or lucky draw, whatever you call it. Um, without wasting further time, um, I know in the past, you know, I've been pulling the names until I see the person in the room, but but this time, I think, you know, we'll just t draw three cards from the 
bowl here, and if they're in the room, they'll receive the gift. If they're not in the room, uh, we can send it, Vivek. Yeah, thank you very much. So I would like to ask uh, Mr. Paul Wilson here to draw three cards. Three cards. Three cards. Okay. Are they, do they need to be in order? No. All the same. Okay. We have. Ooh. Okay. Abhishek Mishra from Nixie. Oh. Second, we have AJ Kumar from Nixie. <laughs> and third, we have Ad Ajist Pasquale from Paracom. Anyone from uh, Paraquam here to receive the gift? Anyone? No? Okay, we will send it to this person. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much again, once again, for all our members for visiting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now we go to the closing. Uh, Paul Wilson, our DZ, to offer his word of thanks. Thank you very much, Garab. We've got a few, a few people to thank, as usual, uh, for their support of this meeting. The hosts, of course, are CERT CC, Sri Lanka CERT CC. Um, do we have some, do we have a gift or a, a, something sunny for? If not, then we'll be presenting a, um, a token of appreciation to the hosts, Sri Lanka CERT CC. Platinum sponsor was Oracle for the uh, for the social, which I think everyone uh, remembers is a fantastic night. There's no one here, unfortunately, from from Oracle, but we should thank them uh, nevertheless uh, for their support. We have uh, Dialogue and uh, Lancacom, as well as Gold sponsors for the event. And do we have Dialogue or Lancacom? If not, yep. Yeah, thanks. Carrying the names of these four late, uh, later sponsors on the sleeves of your T-shirt, which they also supported. We have a community sponsor, OPT. Uh, I see Gail coming up. We have Google. Is Donald around? Community and fellowship sponsor. <laughs> we 
Uh, the silver sponsor, who I know is not here, uh, IPv4 Market Group. Uh, Sandra's been with us for a few years now, so let's thank uh, IPv4 Market Group, please. The other fellowship sponsors, APIA and the Internet Society. I'd, I'd like to say um, from the fellowship event that we had last night, fantastic event. Uh, thanks also to the fellows themselves. I mean, congratulations to you all for coming, having the imagination to uh, put in your applications and to be here. It really was uh, wonderful to see you all. You've added something special to this, uh, this week's meeting. Thanks. <laughs> Now, tonight, we will be, have the chance to thank APCHI again, but APCHI is our closing dinner sponsor. Is uh, Henry? Yeah. Do we have APIA or the Internet Society here? I'm sorry. Maz? I th thought not. Maz, please. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. ISOC. New ISOC employees. We'll be thanking Apji at the closing dinner tonight. Uh, just very quickly, I can thank you very much, Naila, uh, Paracom as well. Thank you very much, uh, bronze sponsors, the APNIC member meeting sponsors. We'll uh, provide these gifts uh, just after the closing. Uh, CN Nick, JP Nick, TW Nick, thanks so much uh, again for your continuing sponsorship of the member meeting, uh, the cooperation, cooperation SIG sponsor, Kisa. I'm sure Billy is still here, but thank you very much. Uh, we have more event sponsors uh, mentioned uh, at the beginning and on the board all the way through ICTA, CSSL, LEARN, and the Sri Lankan Convention Bureau who put on, on some fantastic entertainment for us. Thanks to all the uh, chairs and co-chairs. Special mention to uh, Masato-san, who will... Uh, I'm afraid we may not be seeing so much of Masato anymore, but Masato, thanks very much for your contribution, particularly as an outgoing uh, and long-standing contributor. Simon. Shyam, AJ, Zen, Dr. Govind, uh, Billy, Professor Teng, for the measurement boff and our, uh, our women in ICT and uh, fellowship boff presenters. Uh, APIX here as usual, uh, first, uh, still meeting next door. All of the speakers and the moderators who've been here, who've, um, who've made the effort to be here to present uh, what has been a fantastic uh, program. Uh, Rohana from CERTCC, uh, our scrutineers, Alfredo and Andrea, uh, Andrea um, Program Committee, Fellowship Committee, Steno Captioners working there, Magic as usual, Nikki and, uh, and Alan here who've been responsible for this thing. It's, they're not robots or computer programs, they're human beings down here. Thank you. Uh, and APNIC EC, uh, my bosses up here, uh, representatives of the members, thank you so much for your support. Uh, number Council, APNIC staff. Uh, APNIC staff who are here, stand up please. Thank you very much, you've made it all possible. <laughs> all of our uh, colleagues, uh, fellows, guests, everyone who attended here and uh, participated remotely as well. So we'll be in uh, Ho Chi Minh City next February. We've got a few more events coming up. I think you've heard about them and you will. Uh, please stay in touch. We'll see you at Apricot 2017 next year. And I'll hand back to Garab to close off the meeting. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, we almost made it on time. Uh, only four minutes too late. Uh, but uh, I think I'll spend another maybe an hour talking. Uh, <laughs> so that we can all go to dinner from here. Uh, but anyway, I think, uh, as I said at the beginning of the AMM, uh, we've tried a new format. Um, the AMM started in the afternoon, um, and I think it went pretty well. Um, so we'd probably like to get some feedback, 
and the use of your Twitter, Facebook, talking to APNIC staff. Post conference survey that you'll be receiving, all of it, those are really good ways of uh, communicating uh, back to uh, APNIC uh, and the event staff, and us EC will take a look at it. Um, this week, as I've been saying, um, is a big week for the internet um, because of the because we now have PTI. Let's say that way. Right? Um, I would say that I would I will stop saying you know INA transition after this week, and we'll probably start saying things like PTI accountability and you know PTI whatever. Uh, in future, so let's let's stop saying I in a transition because I think we've done with that now. Um, so good luck to any everyone who is working on that, and we've thanked all our folks who worked really hard on it. At times, it became really, you know, some some at sometimes we actually got feedback that this is too much going on, uh, but at the end, I think uh, the process worked. Uh, we all participated. It was pretty intensive. Uh, I had numbers a few days ago, about 800 hours of meetings collectively put on by all the people involved in it. Um, somebody should calculate the amount of air mi airline miles, Paul. Uh, that, that got, you know, uh, people got out of it. But so thanks to everyone on that. That was another one. Um, the third item was the survey. Uh, we've got the survey, we've heard you. We'll be making uh, feedbacks and responses on that very soon. Uh, apart from that, um, you know, I think this has been a good week. Um, I'd really like to thank uh, bo both, our, both our hosts. Uh, first, our hosts from Bangladesh. Um, you know, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, unfortunately, we could not go there. But we'll always support and, you know, we'll always be happy to support events and go back to Bangladesh at some point. Um, and uh, thanks to our hosts in Sri Lanka who stepped up at a very, very short notice and made this event possible. So I'd like to give a applause to both our hosts. Um, I'd actually request our friends from Bangladesh to stand up because I know that we had a really large contingent of Bangladesh folks here um, friends from BDIX, from, you know, ISPAB, uh, and a lot of other folks, uh, BDNOG especially, so. Uh, and again, you know, this is not to undermine our host in Sri Lanka who really helped us out at the last minute. So thanks to uh, Lanka Search CC as well as our members here, our community here, uh, some of whom have been members of APNIC from its very founding. Um, so, you know, it's great to be here. Um, now we have closing dinner at 7 p.m. Uh, which is in the Curry Leaf restaurant, which is kind of behind where we have breakfast. Um, you can probably go out of the doors there and then on the left side. It's a traditional Sri Lankan restaurant. Um, I can tell you, it's got really nice food from when I went there a few years ago. Um, so I'd like to close this uh, off. I will see you in Ho Chi Minh City. But in the meantime, please uh, continue participating. Um, blogs, you know, there are quite a few internet events coming up where we'll know more about the PTI structure. See, I didn't say INI anymore. Um, you have to make a habit of that. Uh, PTI structures, um, I think the next uh, meeting would be for the IRs would be the right meeting. And then I think soon after we have Afrinic and IGF and, you know, just too many of them. Um, so, yes, uh, Last, special thanks to the stenographers. I hope they could cope with my speaking this time. Uh, many years ago, they all complained about me speaking too fast. So I try to, you know, behave myself. Uh, thanks to them, because it's not easy to understand everyone here. 
um, our different, you know, you, you guys probably understand the nuances of accents very well. So thank you very much, uh, Nikki and Alan. Mm -hmm. They thanked us. Uh, so finally, time to close. Uh, have fun, have nice trips back, and I officially close the AMM and the APNIC uh, 42 meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>